Hey VC, this is Carlos from As The Table Turns. Um, I wanted to start a series um, where I will spotlight um, either an artist going through uh, various records uh, throughout their career, or uh, I wanted to spotlight just an album of an artist and maybe dissect that um, and about the different songs, um, their influences during recording, um, how things were recorded, um, and just di different things like that. Um, so uh, I'm gonna start with an artist. I don't know which is gonna be harder, an album or an artist, but, uh, but we'll see how it goes. Um, my first choice is uh, Kenny Dorham. Uh, so it's gonna be a jazz artist, a jazz trumpeter. Uh, it, it, and this won't always be jazz artists. Uh, I'm gonna try and skip around and do different things, um, different genres. Um, so if you're not a big jazz fan, um, you may want to skip this one and go on to my next one if I have one. Um, but anyway, uh, we're gonna see how this goes. Um, I, you know, I, I don't know much about music, so I can't uh, really get into the depths as far as um, chord progressions, um, you know, different stuff like that, time, time signatures. Um, stuff like that. I, I really can't get into that stuff. I can only uh, regurgitate stuff that I've read. So uh, I'm gonna try and do that and try and get a little deep with that kind of stuff, but um, I won't get too deep because once again, I'll be out of my element and not really knowing what I'm saying and I don't want to put stuff out there that's not accurate. Um, and if I do mess up, you can let me know and uh, anything like that. But um, as far as I know, I've just, I'm just gonna kind of lightly go over stuff like that, but uh, it's more about uh, the, the player himself um, and uh, a bit about his style. Um, anyway, um, Kenny Dorham. Um, McKinley Howard Dorham is his name. Um, and he grew up in Fairfield, Texas. Um, went to high school in Austin, Texas. Went and played um, after that in Marshall, Texas. Marshall, Texas, I believe. And he went to school with uh, Wild Bill Davis. Um, then uh, he went into the Army. And um, I don't believe, I don't know if he was in a trumpet, uh, played trumpet there or not. Um, but he did do boxing. Uh, he was part of the boxing team um, from 42 to 43, I believe he was in the army. Um, anyway, he gets out, um, goes to New York, and uh, quickly uh, goes up the ranks because uh, I think by 1945, 1946, he's playing with Dizzy Gillespie and his orchestra. So that's quite a feat <laughs> to, to go from uh, moving there and then within maybe two to three years, you're playing with the, basically one of the biggest bands ever. Um, so Dizzy Gillespie's band. Um, also, you're playing with a trumpeter, a uh, not only a um, not only a guy that has basically written out um, bebop, literally wrote out what bebop was um, and is but um, is a virtuoso in his own right, you know? Uh, Dizzy is a great trumpeter. Um, and, uh, and then, um, anyway, yeah, part, part, of, part of Dizzy's band. Um, then he plays with Billy Eckstein's band, uh, another great, huge uh, band at the time. Um, kind of going in between those two bands. Um, he plays for Lionel Hampton uh, for a little while, which um, Lionel Hampton uh, is a, Another great uh, teacher and mentor for a lot of uh, a lot of people, uh, up and coming trumpeters, musicians of all kinds. Um, then he uh, starts playing with Charlie Parker. Uh, once Miles Davis leaves because of his uh, drug problem, I believe it was his drug problem at that time. Um, he steps in and steps in the shoes of Miles Davis uh, in the Charlie Parker band. So. Um, Great, you know, already like he's got a great career going for himself. Uh, he is one of the most, 
one of the prominent, you know, um, people playing bebop at that time in these different orchestras, in these different bands. Um, and uh, when you're, you know, the person that's thought of second in line to Miles Davis, even though Miles wasn't much of a name at that time, um, you know, Charlie Parker is not going to pick a slouch, you know, he's going to pick someone that can keep up, you know, and, uh, and so if Kenny Dorham can keep up, then, you know, then that's, that's saying a lot. Um, now, uh, at the time, uh, there were other trumpeters that were Miles Davis himself, Fats Navarro, Dizzy Gillespie, all these trumpeters were really, um, the prominent ones that were thought of as trumpeters, great trumpeters at the time. Kenny Dorham was, um, was and is um, still underrated. And he, uh, people still talk about how his name is kind of synonymous with underrated. Um, so, and he must have been, because if you're able to keep up with Dizzy Gillespie and you're able to keep up with Charlie Parker and you're second in line to Miles Davis in Charlie Parker's quintet, you're playing with Billy Eckstein, you're playing with Lionel Hampton, you're playing with Mercer Ellington, um, you know, you're obviously at the top of the game. Um, so, um, but yes, Kenny Dorham was always thought of as, uh, or not thought of, in, in the critic circles, in the public view, and the public mindset, he was never thought of as the trumpeter to go to. Although, all the musicians obviously thought he was. So he was more of a musician's musician. Um, he uh, then goes on to, um, after playing with Charlie Parker, uh, he goes on to play with Art Blakey and the Jazz Messengers. Um, being kind of the first group, um, the first um, organized group of the Messengers, uh, the first lineup. Um, then he um, then he goes on to after that um, form his own group called the Jazz Prophets um, for uh, I think a couple albums, um, the Kenny Dorham Quintet, and then. Um, Kenny Dorham uh, at the Bohemia, Cafe Bohemia. Um, so I think those two are basically the Jazz Prophets playing. Um, then he um, steps in for uh, Clifford Brown in the Max Roach Quintet or Quartet. Um, he, uh, and it, once again, you're taking over for Clifford Brown. Um, you, and Max and Clifford were super close, so he's not going to, Max isn't going to go, let's just get someone, you know, he's going to go, who's going to be the best person to fill Clifford's shoes? Um, and it was Kenny Dorham. Um, and that is saying a lot. Uh, Clifford Brown is just a virtuoso. If, you know, going from Charlie Parker, virtuoso to stepping into, Clifford Brown's shoes, uh, that's, those are huge shoes to fill. Um, and, uh, yeah, so then he goes from there, uh, he plays with Thelonious Monk on, uh, Genius Volume 2. Uh, he plays with Sonny Rollins. He plays with, um, it's, you know, countless people. Everybody at Blue Note, you know, he plays with those people. Um, he actually, in 1948, um, learns uh, arranging, um, goes to school and learns arranging. Um, and uh, he starts arranging for people. Uh, Mary Lou Williams, um, I'm forgetting the other names right now, but he, he arranges quite a bit of music for people. Um, I'm sure he starts writing his own music uh, at this point um, for himself. Um, the, uh, the album that we're actually listening to right now is uh, Afro-Cuban. Um, and with Kenny Dorham, the thing you're going to see is, uh, at least with three of his albums, um, you, you, he loves this Latin tinge, this Latin, um, rhythm, the Latin rhythms, uh, and playing with those. So, um, that's the album that we're playing right now. Um, and, uh, and, and I think, I think this, uh, this Latin rhythm thing, he's kind of picking up from Dizzy, being with Dizzy and being with Charlie, because um, at Dizzy and Charlie were also playing with um, 
with the Latin rhythms uh, uh, when, when Kenny was with them um, in the mid 40s, late 40s. Um, they were playing with Machito and they were playing with Mario Balsa and uh, Chano Pozo and Mongo Santamaria and different people like that. So um, I'm sure that's where, where Kenny Dorham kind of gets that feel and he must like it because he, this is, this is one of his first albums. Um, I think it's his second album. Like I said, I think that uh, Kenny Dorham Quintet is his first, first album. Um, then we go into uh, Quiet Kenny, um, which uh, it reads on the back that this isn't called Quiet Kenny because he's quiet. Um, the songs are quiet, uh, ballads or something like that. It's, it's because of his personality and the way he is. He's not a showboat. He was never about showboating talent. He, um, he has a very straightforward uh, lyrical style. Uh, it's very clear. There's a lot of clarity, clarity to his playing. He also, um, a lot of trumpeters, I guess, would play um, uh, their progressions or their chords. They would be playing, they would slur a little bit to smooth them out in between. Um, but Kenny didn't do that. He played a lot with his tongue uh, and using his tongue to kind of create this pulsating staccato type um, type feel. Um, once again, like I said at the beginning, I'm not in, uh, I'm not a music head like as far as knowing you know music and how to read music and all that kind of stuff and pro progressions and chords and time signatures and stuff like that. But anyway, that's what I've read. Um, and uh, another thing that he did um, that people uh, that I read about was uh, his turnbacks, uh, which I guess are the end of the progression, uh, the chord progression. He had uh, a, a really uh, unique way of ending his progressions uh, and getting to that chord uh, at the end, that note or at the end. Um, so. Um, yeah, anyway, I was on the, uh, talking about the, um, the Latin. One of the records, uh, Uno Mas, um, recorded this in 1963. Um, Joe Henderson's on this record, and Kenny Doran's kind of responsible for getting Joe Henderson's recording career started with Blue Note, um, on this record. Um, and, uh, in Kenny's words, um, and things that Kenny's uh, said is that him and Joe thought a whole lot uh, alike. Um, they, uh, I think the, the title track, Una Mas, um, is uh, when, when Kenny wrote it, he, he handed it over to Joe, or he wrote the melody for it, and then he handed it over to Joe, and Joe wrote the chords for it, and Kenny said, that's exactly what I would have done. Um, so they're, they're thinking about music and the way things should progress and sound um, were the same. Um, I think he even says that they, you know, they felt like they were breathing at the same time. That's how close they were uh, on, on their thinking of how stuff should be heard and sound. Um, but, um, but yeah, once again, a Latin, Latin vibe on the Una Mas. Um, and then, uh, once again, on uh, Trompeta Toccata, um, he, uh, a Latin influence on this, you know? Um, and so I think he's getting that Latin influence, like I said, from, uh, from Dizzy and from Charlie. But, um, but yeah, so he, he definitely likes that, that Latin rhythm. And I think from what he said in the, about Afro-Cuban, I think it's, it's the groove. It's those relaxing grooves that you can kind of get into with the Latin, um, the Latin vibe and the, the Latin sound uh, and the Latin uh, time signatures, I'm guessing. Um, but, uh, but once again, uh, just a very underrated artist. Uh, after playing with uh, Art Blakey you know, and leaving there, he was replaced with Lee Morgan. You know, so once again, he's synonymous with Lee Morgan being uh, swapped out with him. And then after Lee Morgan, Freddie Hubbard. So it's just, you know, this lineage of, of great trumpeters. Um, and Kenny is always thought of as second to them um, rather than 
usually the people that come before others, they're thought of as greater, you know, um, because they're the people that kind of started stuff and maybe influenced the people that come after them. Um, but, uh, but not with Kenny. He's always just, um, <laughs> I think, uh, one quote that I read was, uh, he's always going to be, um, he's always going to be the bridesmaid and never the bride. Uh, that's kind of, uh, Kenny's, um, burden, um, that he's going to carry with him, you know, and I think it, I think it comes from, once again, his, uh, a person's style of playing, you think of Dizzy Gillespie, you think of that personality, that wild man, you know, he's just like out to have a good time and really fun and very charismatic and gregarious. Um, and I don't think Kenny was that way. I think he was quiet Kenny. I think he was, um, I got to change the record out real quick. Sorry. So like I was saying, you know, he's not, he's not Dizzy Gillespie. Um, and that's not his personality. His personality is a bit more reserved, a bit more uh, straightforward, and I think, uh, I don't think, I, you know, your personality comes comes out through your horn, you know, and so it's the way you play. Um, and I think that his, uh, that's where his straightforward, getting to the point, um, not using all these flourishes, um, but, um, but rather than using, you know, seven notes, he's gonna use three notes to get to the point. Um, and um, maybe not doing all those types of things maybe hurt him as well as far as critics and people. You know, um, you have to have a little bit more of an ear to hear uh, why he's great. Um, you know, and once again, all the musicians, musicians are that way where it's, you know, they're not the people that get popular, it's the people that they write the songs for that get popular, you know. Um, and so I think. Um, I think that, you know, that probably affected his, uh, his renown, um, uh, or lack thereof, you know, in, in the circles, in the circles that counted the people that bought records, right? And the people that, uh, critiqued records. Um, so, um, so yeah, but, uh, but Kenny Dorham, you know, uh, great trumpeter, um, um, uh, came up through blues and bebop and was one of the pioneers of those things, you know, um, even though he's never thought of as that. Um, and uh, went on to create some great uh, bands and, uh, or a great band and, um, you know, arranged some, some great songs for, for others. Uh, uh, Blue, Blue Bossa is uh, kind of one of his uh, crowning achievements as, as an arranger um, for himself. He uh, created the song Blue Bossa. Um, yeah, so uh, look him up, uh, give him a listen. Uh, these are great records. Uh, Afro-Cuban, one we've been listening to. Uh, Quiet Kenny. Uh, and like I said, I don't have all his stuff. I have four records, but you know, I felt like out of, I think he has like, 12 records, something like that. Four is pretty good, pretty good. Un, una mas. Um, and I've listened to the others, you know, on Spotify, just don't own them. Um, but uh, Trompeta Toccata. Um, but yeah. Um, so yeah, give them a listen. Um, check them out. Uh, they're uh, Blue Notes doing a sale right now. Um, you know, this is you'll you'll see the date of when I post this video but um, but yeah they're doing a sale right now 20% uh, off free shipping um, if you spend I think over 70 bucks or something like that um, so anyway but they got they got uh, all these records except for uh, this one because this was on uh, new jazz one of uh, prestige prestige's uh, labels I believe um, so anyway uh, yeah, check him out. Um, really awesome, especially if you like the that Latin that Latin feel. Um, you're gonna get it with him. Um, so uh, I'll try and see if I can do some more of these. Uh, let me know what you think and how it went. Um, if I miss some big things, let me know what those things are. Uh, I tried to kind of cover most of it, but um, yeah. All right, see you later, BC.